Right. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Philip Larea, the publisher of Minute Dot, financial advisor, as well as John Cameron, uh, a development officer at Pacific Legal Foundation, also the author of Re Kill, Rewire, and Aristocracy. Welcome to the show. Uh, we're on the air at www.accesssacramento.org on the web, channel 17 in uh, Sacramento, as well as uh, Facebook and YouTube. Um, trade talks uh, between Trump and Xi Jinping, president of China, while they uh, had dinner in Rio de Janeiro. So, so what happened? Is, do we have a great new trade deal, or is it all smoke and mirrors? Uh, somewhere in between, very likely. Uh, but it's a trade war that, uh, you know, that the U.S., as, as Trump put it, you know, we have more bullets than you do. Uh, the fear was that what's in place right now is China had identified, you know, $250 billion worth of U.S. goods that it wanted to put a 10 percent tariff on, which is in effect now. The U.S. had done the same. Uh, the problem for China is what they export, what they import from us is oil, and they absolutely desperately need the oil. So they're, they don't really have any leverage to speak of, whereas, you know, we've probably got all Can they not buy oil from Iran? Well, it takes instance? U.S. dollars, but there is an interesting point to that, and that was why um, uh, some people may have seen the market just got destroyed today for about a half a day. And over what that was about was a, uh, a CFO of one of the largest Chinese companies called Huawei, it's an uh, uh, information technology telecom company, seventh largest company in the world. Um, they, Canadian authorities arrested the CFO uh, with Who was the, the daughter idea. of the founder, right? Exactly. Yeah. And so this is, you know, in, in our terms, it would be like if uh, the CFO of Oracle was arrested uh, in, like Thai arrest, in like Thailand a, to yeah. be extradited to China. Yeah. And so it's a huge deal. Uh, and uh, uh, the whole point of that was that um, she's going to be accused of uh, selling components, uh, advanced, web, advanced technology, to the Iranians. And that is what she is being extradited and accused of. Mm. And that all plays back into this whole China war that is going on. Um, and, uh, you know, this was considered to be sort of a shot across the bow in the negotiation. Uh, so at the end of the day, what seems to have happened in um, Argentina at the G20 seat meeting was that they declared a truce. The U.S. Uh, Trump and Xi declared a truce. The new tariffs scheduled to be 25 percent of goods going in either direction. Uh, that has been suspended while negotiations are ongoing. And that was cheered by the market because that's you know it's a big deal that was coming up in a month and uh, uh, the run up to that meeting on Friday and then the announcement that the truce had been called a uh, great market cheer until everybody looked at it well you know they really didn't agree on anything except not to go into effect on January one they they agreed to kill more uh, dealers of uh, some some uh, fentanyl. Mm. Well, that was a, a separate part of the story. Yeah. Uh, you know, they, uh, I think Trump said, you know, we should kill them. We should execute them. No. Question. Um, there have been many people in the Trump camp and a lot of Trump supporters who say that, that this is uh, Trump following uh, uh, the art of the deal, that he has, right. he has dropped in communications, and, and we've talked about it a couple of times, that he's, he's said almost as an aside, well, why don't we just get rid of tariffs? You know, trade war, trade war, trade war, why don't we get rid of tariffs? What do you think the likelihood is, is that this is basically an object lesson to the world that, that tariffs are dangerous, tariffs are bad, tariffs are harmful. Let's sit down, roll up our sleeves, and get rid of them. I don't, do think, think, I don't think I don't think I don't think I was a deep enough thinker to be. Thinking well, that you know, no, but that that already happened uh, at the G7 last year. He proposed uh, on the last day of the summit to say, uh, you know, wh within the G7, let's have no tariffs at all. And they said, absolutely not. He proposed to um, Germany bilaterally to say, hey, you know, your big export to us are your cars. You know, we would like to export to you. Why don't we just make a bilateral agreement to remove tariffs on cars? And uh, again, Merkel said, well, I'll think about it. But mm -hmm. she shot it down ultimately. I think that Trump's idea, and he's right, uh, Trump's idea is whatever it is. If, you know, if the tariffs on, you know, $250 billion worth of U.S. goods 
are 20%, then you better believe what you've got coming in is going to be 20%. And that is what killed our, uh, really, our employment base, manufacturing, textiles, you name it. Um, so I don't think it's a ploy. I think he would go either way. But I think at the end of the day, his real negotiating styles, you saw with Canada and Mexico, is once you know the the huzzas over the weekend were done, then he goes to his other style, which is you know absolute bellicosity, absolute extreme. So yeah, he's got somewhere at, to compromise. If you, if you take too. a look at the U.S. and whatever the heck they're calling it, the the new NAFTA, it's the same old NAFTA. He didn't really change anything. You know, there are some changes at the margin. A few, you can you know, in, exactly. import a little bit more butter. Now, you know, I mean, it's it's it's. It's a, got a different name. Well, and that's why to the yeah, original that's, question, that's all. to the original question, is it all smoke and mirrors? No. Is it a great deal? It is going. It um, uh, is more sound and fury than substance, very likely. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day. Uh, what it's going to come down to is that China needs our oil and has to pay for it with U.S. dollars. Well, uh, I'm not so sure. I mean, that's, that's the way it, it's working now with the petrodollar and with Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. uh, guaranteeing that... Uh, I mean, the, the, journalism, dollars, the journalist killers? The journalist killers. Well, yeah. yeah. And, and, and why, do you think, why do you think that the Khashoggi murder, and that's what it was, is being poo-pooed by the Trump administration? It's to preserve the petrodollar. It's mm -hmm. to preserve the uh, trading of oil in dollars to put the squeeze on Iran and other uh, countries that need to buy oil, namely China. Uh, and yeah, I, but, but in the long run, I mean in the short run, yeah, that, that might make sense. But in the long run, I mean China is building a, a road from China to uh, Brussels. Uh, you know the, the the new Silk Road, and they're they're you know they're doing it not only overland, but also across the Indian Ocean by sea. They are putting together uh, a trade route that could conceivably exclude the United States entirely, and it's not all smoke and mirrors. I mean, China they're serious people, they're smart people, uh, and they are becoming more capitalist than we are in many, many well, respects. Well, but uh, I, China doesn't have the time. Uh, this year their uh, economy grew at the slowest rate since 2009, which was, of course, you know, the financial collapse. Uh, China just simply doesn't have the time or the currency reserves to sit it out. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's going to be an interesting day-to-day. Uh, -day. Uh, I suspect that we'll end up with uh, a, a deal, much like the, uh, the, the successor to NAFTA, which is essentially the same deal, but uh, it's Trump's deal now, so it's, it's beautiful. And big well, I'm, I'm going I'm to go, out, I'm go out on a limb and say that, that, uh, that it, things will end up better after this than before, that we'll have freer trade than we did. I think it is, is a negotiating ploy. I, I, um, I'm not saying Trump's a genius. He's certainly not my favorite president. Um, I think we're going to talk about one that. Well, let's talk about your, let's talk about your, your favorite president, George well, H. W. Bush. I'm, I'm Calvin Coolidge is probably my oh, favorite Calvin, president. Oh, okay, Calvin Coolidge. But uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, they're, they're, you have to separate the president and the man. And as far as men goes, um, you know, a lot of people uh, despise um, uh, the current guy. Was his name Trump? Um, Trump the trumpeter, for uh, as much. Uh, for his persona as anything and and um, if you can be a Republican president and be admired and liked by the press corps then I think um, your 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 uh, your gravitas your your moral basis your personality and everything has to be at a high level and that's that was George H.W. Bush i he, you know, he was head of the CIA, so there's some yin and yang going on. I don't think anybody but a sociopath can be head of the CIA. But, you know, he's a, as, as an 18-year-old boy, uh, he left a, a life of luxury and wealth, silver spoon in his mouth, born that way, and and went into the military and was one of the youngest pilots in the Navy. And he volunteered. Uh, and he I mean, volunteered yeah, to do it. Uh, he was he was shot down. Um, Unfortunately, the other the other guys in the plane didn't make it, um, and and torpedo um, torpedo planes are are basically uh, targets. They in order to drop their torpedoes now. This this before the age of smart torpedoes, where you could drop it. You could drop it as you're flying this way, and it will home in and go that way. Torpedo if the ship is going here. 
There's one and one track only that the torpedo plane has to follow, and it's right here, and the gunners know it, the opposing aircraft know it, everybody knows it, and basically it's shoot that duck, shoot that duck, shoot that duck, shoot that duck, maybe one torpedo goes through. So he was in probably the most dangerous, even more dangerous from a, from a mortality standpoint than, than the long-range bombers over Germany in World War II. Um, and he volunteered for it, and he was a brave and, man. And flew 30-some missions it's doing that? Like 50, I yeah, think. And then he went into training. And then he, uh, yes, you know, he had a wealthy father who helped, but he moved his family from, you know, from, from the East Coast and moved to Texas and was a millionaire in the oil business by the time he was 40. Um, he was a, a, you know, a family, loved his family, um, and... Um, you know, had a beautiful family, and, and uh, his first daughter caught leukemia, and, and, uh, and his wife's hair turned white shortly after that. But, you know, he was, he, was a, he was a nice man in many respects, even in moments where, you know, they, they, they say that one of the ways to judge a person is how they treat people who can be of no benefit to them. And, and George Bush wrote something like 5,000 thank you notes in the course of his life, handwritten thank you notes. And yes, some of them were to the people that gave him half a million dollars for his campaign. It used to be cheaper to buy a presidency in the old days than it is now. But some of them were to the maitre d's of a hotel who, who um, got his Secret Service agent's uh, coat dry cleaned when somebody spilled something. You know, I, I, so he, was, he, he, he treated people... Who, who could not benefit him very well. And I think yeah. that's a great mark of a, of a man. Yeah, no, I think he was a decent man. Yeah. I, I question his uh, uh, willingness to run the Central Intelligence Agency. I suspect that there was probably mm -hmm. uh, some parts of that that were a little bit, uh, that we'll never know about, mm -hmm. that were a little bit on the, on the uh, on the, uh, oh, I agree. I just thought I'd talk about side. the good parts, and we can now talk and, about the not so and, good but parts. Here's, here's, I'll talk about the, uh, another good part. Mm -hmm. Does the name April Glaspie ring a bell? Name what? April Glaspie. No. Does that okay? She was yeah. the uh, ambassador to Iraq prior to the first Iraq War mm -hmm. at a at a uh, a function in which uh, April Glaspie was there and Saddam Hussein was there. Saddam Hussein said. Uh, we're thinking about, uh, you know, taking. We think that that uh, Kuwait is our property, and we're thinking about uh, taking it over. Would the United States have any problem with that? I'm paraphrasing. Mm -hmm. And April Glaspie said, I, you know, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. So Saddam, understandably, thought, hey, I've got the green light to take over Kuwait. I'm going to mm -hmm. do it, mm -hmm. and he did. Mm -hmm. uh, April Glaspie ended up, obviously, uh, not being the ambassador for, a, for, for for very much longer. Was she drunk at the time? Or? I don't think so. I think she just was misinformed mm -hmm. or, you know, or didn't, you know, got off the, the party line, whatever. I don't know. I'll have to who look knows what her, Who knows what her motivation was. But she was not talking, she was not, that was not official U.S. policy, mm -hmm. obviously, and that precipitated the first Iraq war. But George... Bush, George <coughs> H. W. Bush did what should be done, short of declaring war. He should have, you know, gone to Congress mm -hmm. and got a declaration of war. But he did the next <coughs> best thing. He put together a coalition of everybody in Europe, as well as a whole bunch Excuse of people uh, in 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 the Middle East, to say this cannot stand. We will fight a war to return the sovereignty of of Kuwait mm -hmm. and drive Saddam out of there. That's our mission. It's a limited mission. Once we accomplish that mission, war done. And that's exactly what he did. He drove Saddam out of Kuwait and then let, let Saddam be. Well, and you, I and, think you have and, to kind of and, give them a little credit, too, for, um, you know, as and, director and, and, of the CIA. And, and I have to say the Kuwait, that, that Iraq, under Saddam, as brutal as he was, uh, it was probably a more stable nation than it is under whoever the heck's running it now. Well, and just before that, as director of the CIA, uh, vice president, and then president, when you think about, you know, uh, presiding over the fall of the Berlin Wall, the collapse of the Soviet Union, obviously Reagan gets a lot of the credit, mm -hmm. but obviously all of that, that's often the vice president's preliminary roles to soften that up. Plus, um, well, not only that, but Reagan was out of office when the Berlin Wall fell. Exactly. It happened under Bush's mm -hmm. uh, watch. Exactly. And he was able to finesse it in such a way that he was not doing, you know, a Trumpian gloat 
you know, we beat, we beat the bad guys. Yeah. He was able to do it in such a way that, that Germany was reunited. I'm not sure that was a good thing, but it, it happened. Uh, I'm not sure that was a good thing. Noriega and Panama. Larger companies are, are not as good as smaller countries. But, <laughs> but at the same time... State the, of Jefferson going to be our next... Uh, yeah. Hey, if, if, you, if, that, if you could ever get it through Congress, I think it would be great. No, There's no too. way, no way you're going to get it through Congress. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they don't want to give up Congress power. does not want four more California senators. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or two more, however many it would take. Uh, but, you know, I, I mean, and the freedom of freeing of Eastern Europe, the satellite mm -hmm. states in Eastern Europe were freed. Uh, he was able to do it in such a way that he was able to, to work Gorbachev, work the diplomacy. He was, he was, a, good, he was a great diplomat. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, uh, 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 Panama, Noriega. Hmm. Yeah, um, well, you think of what he got done in a fairly yeah, short not, period not, of time. So you know, sure um, you know, uh, his foreign policy. It was, you know, for a, even for a two-term president, would have been, you know, quite hmm. remarkable. Yeah, I, I don't know if I gave him kudos for, for what happened in Panama. That, I mean, that was really not our fight. Hmm. But that's that's not. Well, story. he almost accomplished. But he didn't quite accomplish uh, um, having. Peace talks with a crazy man in North Korea, but he was close. <laughs> he was close. Oh, wait, Trump doesn't get any do credit that. for that, does he? Fed yeah. Chairman Jerome Powell a few weeks ago said, we are a long way from neutral on interest rates. Uh, this week he said, uh, just below the broad range of estimates of the level that would be neutral for the economy. Why do we allow one man to set the price of money, interest rates are the price of money, price controls on money. Why, for the last 105 years, have we have allowed one person or one or seven people, if you want to count the entire board, to dictate prices of the most important price in the economy? Well, and uh, you know, uh, to preface that, it, that the notion of being able to do that, it was came from Alexander Hamilton and was rejected for 150 years. Uh, there was a brief period, a temporary period, where they were allowed, they had something like a 15-year charter, and uh, they threatened Andrew Jackson as he was running for re-election, said, well, we'll support you and you will get re-elected, or we won't support you and you will not. Well, Jackson went ahead and got re-elected and disbanded that Fed, took all of the money and paid down the national debt. It's the only time the U.S. was ever debt-free. You fast forward to this progressive period of history, and the idea of the Fed the was that... The banks got their revenge. Well, uh, the idea was... To the, the tune of $21 the, trillion dollars in debt. The justification was that about every 10 or 11 years, we would have a run on the banks. Uh, some question of uh, what is a liquidity problem. Um, well, it was an inventory cycle. And so uh, the idea was, well, if we had the separate agency that would provide um, a guaranteed backstop of liquidity to the banking system so that we wouldn't get a run on the banks, it's worth having them. That's his real reason for being. Well, that's the excuse. But that's every 11 years. So the idea was, okay, you've got a charter, you've got a mandate that says, you know, we want prices stable, and um, we want you to foster full employment. They're the only central bank in the world that has that foster full employment uh, mandate. Based on the fallacious Phillips curve, but that's another story. But uh, when it comes down to it, when you say, what is, uh, so I brought all of that up because the Federal Reserve um, isn't supposed to exist. It was hotly resisted for 150 years and suddenly came into existence under progressivism, 1913. The Federal Reserve knows that it need not exist. In 2016, there was a substantial movement to either end the Fed altogether or to turn it into this really sort of technocratic institution that does very little, to, you know, something like the, the Treasury. The, the Taylor rule? Uh, and these uh, go back to John Taylor. They asked Trump um, at uh, the beginning of his state, Trump asked his senators um, before he took office, who should I nominate? And all of them came back with John Taylor, who is a rules-based, if inflation is this, then interest rates are this. We don't look into crystal balls. Um, you take that away and you've taken away the power of the Fed. Ironically, it was Ted Cruz who weaseled out, who was the co-sponsor of the bill to audit the Fed, and he didn't cast the vote that turned out to be the deciding vote. He was on the presidential trail. Fast forward to 2018. He was, not uh, he was uh, on the campaign trail. Uh, <laughs> he was the last guy to challenge Trump. Fast forward to today. The Fed well remembers that it need not exist. It well remembers how one more screw-up 
that you know somebody's going to come in and say what why do we have these guys so their hold on their hold on power is tenuous why do we have these guys why do we why do we have these guys i mean seriously i i um, what was the, the what was the island where they had the meeting? What was the name of the Jekyll uh, Island? Yeah. What Jekyll Island? Jekyll Island. Yeah. So um, Jekyll and Hyde basically is no. Is, it's, it is, is nothing about power. It is only about power to be the yeah. indispensable institution. So the Fed makes they all go out there and make speeches virtually every day, and those speeches move the market. So today we saw the market was down eight hundred points on the Dow, based on China news. Um, somebody came out in the middle of the day and said maybe the Fed won't raise interest rates in December and the market completely recovered. So if we ask what the Fed is doing, uh, Jerome Powell on October 3rd with the market S&P trading and pretty close to an all-time high uh, said we're very far from neutral on interest rates. It was shocking because we were clearly, the housing market has, had, had already collapsed. You know, 2018 has been worse than 2017. There were recognition of that everywhere in the economy is softening and yet he said that well six weeks later uh thanksgiving week uh the s p officially went into correction territory for territory for the first time powell took the next opportunity to say we are uh, very near neutral well very near neutral uh, just below the broad range of estimates well, here's Which the thing. Which doesn't mean a whole, doesn't mean as much as it, it sounds like on the surface. Well, here's what happened though, and this is what everyone is paying attention to now. More important than China, something called the inverted yield curve. Oh yeah, it, it inverted. And so, rather, you know, can't explain. You know, it's a longer explanation, but the upshot of it is, is that an inverted yield curve has preceded the last seven recessions. It's an almost guaranteed recession. And uh, stock market uh, and it correction. And it inverted. Yeah. So. It's already inverted between the three and the five year. Uh, so the, the three is yielding higher than the five? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Never has the three and the five inverted when the two and the 10 did not follow. Uh, and I know that's kind of esoteric, but the upshot of it is, is that the market looked at that and said, oh, holy cow. There are real economic reasons why that matters, whether it has to do with a bank issuing a mortgage, how much it has to pay for CD. There are real effects in the economy. But those of us that know a little bit of the history say, oh, here it comes. So that, uh, so now the, mo the market mover today was the Fed had said, hey, we're raising rates every three months out into 2020. <clears throat> he made that comment about, well, who, who, maybe who, only one more. Who, who uh, made the, the comment today that uh, there would not be a, a rate increase in December? Well, it was actually an analyst saying, oh. you know, that's already inverted. And if he raises interest rates, so an, in an December, analyst with a big following, I take it, said, you know, hey, I don't see how they can do it, and I agree. No. Um, so Powell is responding to not what he's trying to do, which is break the economy to be the indispensable institution. What he's responding to is that all of the focus is on him to blame for it. And if Trump gets reelected, you know, he said a couple of weeks ago, he said that was the single mistake I've made in my presidency, in my view, was my appointment of the Fed. Well, he's the first president, in my memory, to uh, actively criticize Fed publicly. policy mm -hmm. publicly, not, not to mention his own appointee. Yes. And so I can see a path where the Fed is now in a hot spot because if Trump gets reelected, and they broke the economy, and everybody knows it was the Fed that broke the economy. You will, you will get. Uh, first thing Trump gets to do is renominate a, a Fed chair, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if it's someone like John Taylor. Question: um, <clears throat> it, This is it the cart before the horse in this? Do you think that uh, this is part of the deep state trying to eliminate Trump? Let's kill this rip roaring economy that. Uh, he's going to take credit for by slamming on the brakes on interest rates and creating it's, another recession so he can get so the bum Trump. out. If you, look, if you did an overlay of since the Fed's existence from 1913 to present and you did an overlay of when the Fed was either neutral or easy, it was always during a Democratic administration. If you looked at, if you did an overlay of all the Republican presidents and said when was the Fed neutral going to tightening, 
it was always in a Republican administration. So do you think that basically the Fed favors then the Democratic oh, Party? Oh, unquestionably. It's a progressive institution. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't exist without it? progressivism. I, I hate to call it progressive. I hate to call it liberal. Let's call it the Labor Party, which is what it is. Let's call well, it socialist. Well, if it benefited labor, we would. But <laughs> what it really is is, uh, you know, it, it is what it was named under Teddy Roosevelt. It, you know, it is what it is. Speaking uh, of... of, uh, of uh, limousine liberals, uh, Michael Bloomberg is no longer a Republican. He has re-registered as a Democrat and has been touring Iowa, of all places. There's already something like 20 or 30 people angling for the 2020 Democratic mm -hmm. nomination. Michael Bloomberg could sell his eponymous firm and self-fund uh, much more uh, effectively than, than Trump, who is a quasi-billionaire. I would think. Mm -hmm. Well, and Bloomberg uh, actually spent uh, quite a bit of money. He spent $110 million of his own money getting Democrats elected. So, um, you know, when the, when the so-called liberals, and I, I just want to call them the Labor Party or the Socialist Party or, or the Deep State, talk about, uh, you know, the, the fact that these corporations shouldn't be able to buy elections, then they need to look in the mirror because in the last election cycle, the, well, the midterm elections, what did the, the, the Democrats outspend the Republicans, Republicans, what, two to one or three to one? Something like that. So, you know, admittedly with JNSP, ask me, um, you know, the piper is going to be paid. They're not going to have nearly as much union money to play with. But if you got people like, uh, was it St Steyer? What's Steyer, it Steyer, Soros, uh, Soros no, no, Bloomberg. and, there's, and there's Bloomberg that, yeah. writing you know, fifty million, hundred million dollar checks. I mean, these the rich republic. I think the the biggest Republican spender was uh, like fifty something million. So, you know, they're buying elections, and and um, he's uh, you know he's out there in Iowa. One of the speeches he did. He talks about these. He went to a tech school, I think, where everybody's learning how to do wind turbines. About how wonderful green energy and and how that's where the jobs are and all the rest of that. And uh, we talked about bird choppers earlier. Uh, you have inconsistent energy that couldn't survive without uh, without uh, without government tax grants. Um, and uh, when the wind doesn't run, it and it chops up raptors. So, but apparently that's that's a cool thing if you're if you're a Democrat. And well, so he just uh, he just endowed a billion dollars of his personal fortune. Uh, to one of the major progressive uh, institutions. Um, I want to say Harvard, but if it wasn't Harvard. The interesting yeah. times that we live in. It'll be an interesting 2020, no matter who the candidates are. And I think it's a wide open field at this point on both sides. That's the show for tonight. We'll see you again, or all three sides. Let's not forget the libertarian side. Well, we'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint, on uh, the web at www.accesssacramento, and of course uh, on YouTube and Facebook, and Channel 17 in Sacramento. Thank you.